Hello and welcome to the West Asia Post. Happy New Year to all our viewers. I am Redi Francis standing in the heart of Beirut. And for the next half hour, I will get you all the latest updates, stories, news from the region that I call home, West Asia. Now starting with our top story, which is in Riyadh. Riyadh has welcomed the Portugal star forward, Cristiano Ronaldo, very warmly upon joining the Saudi team and Nasser. Now this is the most highest profile player to ever join a Gulf country. Let's take a look. See you soon, Nasser fans. The new hero of Al Nasr, Cristiano Ronaldo, en route Riyadh. And this is how he was welcomed in his new team. A sea of yellow and blue greeted the icon at Al Nasr's home ground, Masood Park. Where thousands of fans turned up to witness his unveiling. And he obliged them amid the grand welcome around the 25,000 seater stadium. Joining him here, his children and his girlfriend, Georgina Rodriguez. Georgina wore the traditional black abaya or all-covering robe worn by most Saudi women. To Saudi the Portugal captain joined Al Nasr last week. He had had an acrimonious split with Manchester United in November. Media reports suggest his two-and-a-half-year deal with Al Nasr will see him earn more than $210 million. Well, so far feeling very good. I'm so proud to make this big decision in my, in my life, in football. As you mentioned before, in Europe, my work, it's done. I, I won everything. I play in the most important clubs in Europe. And for me now, it's a new, new challenge. As you mentioned, in Asia, I'm glad for that uh, Al Nasser gave me this opportunity to to show and develop not only for the for the football but also for the generation, the young generation, the women's generation as well, for the young boys. And for me it's it's a challenge, but in the same way it's I feel very, very happy and very proud. Ronaldo's new teammates are young men who've idolized him for as long as they remember. The Al Nasr coach and the club's president termed Ronaldo's signing up here a massive milestone for the Saudi Arabian League. Cristiano is one of the best players in the world in the story of the football. He's a legend, so it's an honor for sure for me, but also for Al Nasr to welcome uh, Cristiano, and uh, I'm sure that for Russian Saudi League and of also for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, is um, it's really a fantastic thing that uh, Cristiano is coming with us to play. He's the best player in football history, so it's normal that he becomes the player with the highest salary in the world. This is something he deserves, and we only gave him what he deserves. But I want to clarify another side of the negotiation which reflects how professional Cristiano is. During the negotiations, one of the discussion points, he showed that in all other matters, he wants to be treated like all the players on the team, from bonuses and club roles. He wanted to be like any other player, and that is something expected from him. Ronaldo's move to Al Nasr has been the subject of countless rumors. Some reports even suggest that the previous holder of the number seven shirt was dropped from the squad for refusing to swap shirt numbers. Ronaldo's arrival in Riyadh comes just weeks after the World Cup in neighboring Qatar. And he comes with a vast collection of club honors. He's had a glittering spell at Spanish giants Real Madrid from 2009 to 2018. Ronaldo won two La Liga titles, two Spanish Cups, four Champions League titles 
and three club World Cups there. He also claimed two Series A titles and a Copa Italia trophy in three years at Juventus. The Portugal star then rejoined Manchester United with whom he bagged three Premier League crowns, the FA Cup, two League Cups, the Champions League and Club World Cup. With Ronaldo signing up at Al Nasr against a backdrop of Saudi Arabia's big push into sports, excitement is at fever pitch. Before moving forward, let's take a look at what else is making the headlines across the region. Turkey President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said he may meet Syria's Bashar al-Assad as a part of a new peace process. Last week's defense ministerial meet was the highest level talks between the two foes since the Syrian war began in 2011. UN Security Council stresses the need to maintain status quo at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in Jerusalem. This after Ben Gvir's visit enraged Palestinians. Israel calls the UN meeting absurd. Israel's new hard-right government unveils controversial court reforms that could allow parliament to overturn some Supreme Court rulings and grant the government more say in nominations to the bench. Iran frees top actor Tarane Alidosti, who was jailed for criticizing the crackdown on anti-government protests. Reports citing her lawyer say she has been released on bail. FIFA appoints Saudi Arabia's first female international referee, less than a year after the conservative kingdom's national women's team made their debut. The Syrian army has accused Israel of striking Damascus airport yet again. Now this time, Syria is taking this up with the United Nations, demanding that those responsible be held accountable. Let's take a look. Syria claims yet another Israeli strike at Damascus airport. But this time, Syria has decided not to stay mum over alleged Israeli aggression. The Syrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates has sent two identical letters. This is to the Secretary General of the United Nations and the President of the Security Council. The war-torn nation has condemned the Israeli strikes and called for urgent action to ensure that it does not repeat. Syria claims Israel has a history of aggressive acts and it continues to violate international law and UN charters. On 2nd of January, Syria claimed Israeli missiles struck the capital's airport. According to Human Rights Monitor, the attack killed four, including two soldiers. The strikes even stalled operations at the Damascus airport for several hours. The Syrian state media stated, Israel carried out the strike with barrages of missiles targeting Damascus International Airport and its surroundings a charge that Israel has not confirmed yet. This is the second time in less than seven months that Damascus International Airport has been attacked. The airport was out of service in June of 2022. Israel believes that Damascus Airport has Iranian-backed armed groups and Hezbollah fighters' presence. Israel has carried out hundreds of such airstrikes against its neighbor since civil war broke out in 2011. Israel has been targeting the government troops and allied Iran-backed forces. Israel has made its military operational outlook for 2023 clear. The Israel's Defense Forces head has said that the country will not accept Hezbollah 2.0 in Syria. He further added that Israel's course of action in Syria is an example of how continuous and persistent military action leads to shaping and influencing the entire region. The Syrian conflict that started over a decade ago with brutal repression of peaceful protests has forced around half the country's pre-war population to flee their homes. About half a million people have been killed so far. 
though hostilities have largely abated in the last three years. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, more than 3,800 people died in Syria's war in 2022. The deceased include over 1,600 civilians and this includes 300 children. However, 2022 was also the year when Syria experienced its lowest yearly death toll. West Asia Bureau, Vion, World is One. Palestinians all across the region have been reeling under the Israeli aggression. Now, in the latest, two Palestinian teens were killed by Israeli forces just last week. While in Gaza, Palestinians are risking their lives to flee the region in a hope for a better future. We bring you all the details. This mother is grieving her 16-year-old son, Amir Abu Zitoun's death. He was allegedly shot dead by the Israeli forces in the West Bank city of Nablus. His brother has been detained for two weeks by Israel. Omer asked me, who will go to the Israeli court? I told him, your father is busy and cannot go. He told me, I will go. So I told him, we will go together. To which he replied, no, you stay here, I will go. I miss Mahmoud and I want to see him. I searched for Omer and did not find him. Hundreds of mourners gathered on the streets for the teen's funeral procession. Last night they killed one of the residents. He was standing and looking at them. They shot him with an explosive bullet that shattered his head. His body parts and blood are here. He cried once and that was it. The Israeli military said, Armed suspects fired towards the soldiers who responded with live fire. However, it did not confirm any casualties. Zetoun is reportedly the fourth Palestinian killed by Israeli forces in the West Bank this year. On the 3rd of January, Palestinians had gathered for the funeral procession of a 15-year-old. The boy identified as Adam Esam Shakar Ayad, was reportedly shot dead by Israeli troops in a clash nearby Bethlehem. He used to tell me that he wants to die and become a martyr. And I used to ask him why and tell him that I do not have anyone else but him and that he only has me in his life. He used to say that all martyrs who die were the only child to their parents, and I used to reply and say that I do not have anyone in life but him. I felt like I'm hanging a piece of my heart. It is really unbelievable that we lost Adam. Israel's army said troops fired at Palestinians who threw improvised explosives, rocks and firebombs at them. In December, the United Nations said 2022 had been the deadliest year in the West Bank since records began in 2005 with more than 150 Palestinians killed. Last year, West Bank saw the worst levels of violence in more than a decade. And much of it was concentrated around Nablus and the nearby city of Jenin. The unrest and violence is not restricted to the Palestinians of West Bank alone. The violence has forced many Gazans to flee their homes. This is the family of Yunus al Sher, mourning the 21-year-old's death. He left Gaza dreaming of a better life in Europe, only to return to the Palestinian enclave in a coffin. He wanted as a 21 or 22-year-old young man to secure his future. He dreamt of getting married and building a house, buying a motorbike, opening a project to live off and build his future. These helpless families not only lose their loved ones, but the vultures who take advantage of their helplessness rob their pockets as well. 
Yunus Alsher's family is not the only one to lose their son. Scores of Palestinians risk the perilous journey across the Mediterranean in the hope of finding a better life across the sea in Europe. Unemployment is the main factor that pushes young people to emigrate from this part of the world, in addition to the lack of security due to repeated Israeli aggressions and other problems with water, electricity and pollution. The inauguration of the most right-wing government in Israel's history, led by Benjamin Netanyahu, has sparked fears. Two of Netanyahu's extreme right coalition partners, who have a history of making inflammatory remarks about Palestinians, have taken charge of critical powers regarding the West Bank. Bezalel Smotrich holds the portfolio for Israeli settlement policy in the territory, while Itamar Ben Gavir serves as national security minister with powers over the border police force. <laughs> There are now fears of renewed violence in the region. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Iran tests military drones in its annual drill. Now, this comes at a time when the Iranian drones are already under scrutiny for allegedly participating in the war in Ukraine. We tell you more. Iran, this week, was in the news for a new reason. The Iranian military tested new attack drones in the coastal area of the Gulf of Oman, near the strategic Strait of Hormuz, which is located at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. The region is crucial to global energy supplies, as about a fifth of all oil traded at sea passes through it. According to Iran's state media report, the Ababil 5 attack drone was used during war games for the first time, and it managed to successfully hit its targets with a bomb after traveling 400 kilometers. The Ababil 5 allows an unmanned aerial vehicle to conduct surveillance operations over a broad region at a lower cost and in much less time. An Iranian media report said that the drone test was part of the country's ongoing annual drill called Solfagar 1401. The joint naval air and ground exercises featured commandos, airborne infantry, drones, fighter jets, helicopters, military transport aircraft and submarines. According to a local media report, the drills were organized to improve readiness in confronting foreign threats and any possible invasion attempt. This is not the first time that Iran has tested a military drone. Several such tests have been conducted in the past decade. The military drones have been a point of contention between Iran and the United States and its allies, who claim that Tehran is supplying Moscow with drones. The West believes that Iranian drones have been used in Russian strikes in Ukraine. After much contention, Iran acknowledged in November that it had supplied Russia with drones. However, Tehran said that the supply was made before the war in Ukraine and that it is committed to stop the conflict. Iran has developed a large domestic arms industry in the face of international sanctions and embargoes that had barred the country from importing weapons. The weaponry includes these air defense systems that can be used for surveillance and attacks as well. They can either drop munitions or can fly into a target and blow themselves up. These advanced long-range suicide systems are called kamikaze drones. 
and are designed to hit Israel's Tel Aviv. Iran is also equipped with cruise and ballistic missiles with varying ranges. The Islamic regime views these weapons as a vital form of protection from arch-enemy Israel and the United States. The two nations that have soldiers stationed at bases in the region. Bureau Report, we on. World is one. That's all from our side for this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup, always bringing you the most recent updates and stories and ground reports from the most volatile region in the world. Until then, stay safe. I am Radif Francis from the middle of Beirut, Lebanon, and you're watching We On, World is One.